Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I'm so pleased to welcome you back to our second and final week of a two-week series dealing with a very powerful documentary titled Farmingville. This documentary is receiving great attention across America. In fact, it is unusual for a documentary to make the editorial page of the New York Times of that great newspaper, and this one did. It was a very supportive editorial in February 2004, as well as Newsday in January 2004. I'd like to also indicate that to show the prestige of this documentary that it's already, as of the airing of this program, uh, received four very distinguished honors. First of all, it won the Best Documentary at the 2004 uh, Cine Festival. It won the Best Documentary Feature in the 2004 San Diego Latino Film Festival. It won a Special Juror Award in the 2004 Sundance Film Festival. And last, the Human Rights Award at the River Run Film Festival in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, just a very, very powerful documentary about a town in New York called Farmingville and what happened when uh, uh, immigrants came into that community and the conflicts and even the violence that took place and how the community did successfully or unsuccessfully attempt to deal with this crisis. I'm so pleased to welcome the two co-producers back from last week of this film and we're so pleased that Greg Carr of the Greg C. Carr Foundation has made this possible with a, a funding of their visit to North Idaho College and a discussion on not only this powerful documentary, but showing it uh, at our campus. And I add that uh, it recently aired on the national PBS. First of all, welcome back to the program, Catherine Tambini. Catherine, we had a very powerful discussion last week, and congratulations on what's happening in your documentary. Thank you very much, Tony. And equally pleased to have Carlos Sandoval, who also is a co-producer. You both work beautifully together. and there'll be some great uh, results uh, and some great discussions across America because of your documentary. And with that, I welcome back Erna Reinhardt, our panelist who is the Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College, and she will start today's questioning. Welcome to the show again. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to start with Catherine, and for the, our viewers that, that didn't catch the show last week, could you take just a few minutes out of this show and summarize what the documentary is all about. It's about the a community in Long Island, New York that has a huge conflict to deal with. Tell us a little bit in a few minutes about what, what all the documentary covers. The Farmingville, New York is a small town on Long Island and there was a large influx of Mexican day laborers who stand on the street corners looking for work they crowd into houses, 30 men into a house in a residential neighborhood, which led to lots of tension in the, in the community, which then led to the hate-based attempted murder of two of the day laborers. And we followed the, the town in the year following that hate-based attempted murder when it became the center for the national immigration debate. Excellent. And Carlos, tell us again, what are you hoping to get out of doing the documentary? What are you hoping that people come away with? We're hoping the documentary really acts as a sort of platform for dialogue. Um, we took uh, uh, a difficult approach for us, but I think the only way to go with this, which is to try to be objective, to not try to demonize either side, to try to give a safe space for people who were voicing legitimate concerns to voice them to allow the men who are there, who are mostly Mexican, to be seen as individuals and as humans, uh, self-empowering, capable, full of humor uh, human beings. Um, and so we really wanted to have people walk in the shoes of each of these individuals and ask themselves, if this were to happen in my community, what would my response be? We try not to leave them to that response, but we hope that they'll come out with, with something that is positive. Is there a way that if there are communities in our viewer area that would like to bring this movie or this film, this documentary, to their community, is there a way to do that? Yes, there is. We are working with a, a group called Active Voice, and they are a terrific outreach group. Uh, they are part of American Documentary, and people can go to the web, www.activevoice.net, and click on Farmingville, and there's a whole campaign designed around getting the word out about Farmingville, helping you set up screenings, 
there will be, uh, there is a, um, there are study guides, there's all sorts of information. There are links to other sites that, that will be helpful in whether, if your community is facing some of the similar problems that Farmingville faced. So it's, Active Voice is a really terrific company that we are working with. Also POV, our presenters uh, program, PBS's documentary series. You, if you go to pov.org and click on Farmingville, Excellent. you'll find a lot of the same material and, and further material about where to get hold of us, how to get a copy of the film, etc. Great. Thank you. On that note, again, I'm <coughs> always thinking of our viewers and those who have not seen um, this document that was on PBS a few days ago. Uh, I think we should show a clip and then we'll come back to our discussions. It's about a 45 second clip and we'll show that now. Okay, but this is going to go on all day. Why don't you go have your rally? Reverend, are you agreeable to that? We can kind of separate the two groups a little bit. You can still each uh, have your press conference. No, no, you are not separating us or anything. We're American citizens. We're here in our county Thank you. Well, I need your opinion. I'll ask for it. Thank you. I should give it to you anyway. Don't worry about it. Are you racist, Reverend? What? Are you racist? Are you a racist? No, are you racist? Are you, racist? Hmm? are you asking me if I'm a racist? Mm -hmm. Are you a racist? No, yeah, I'm, I'm asking you first. I'm asking you, are you a racist? No. So Do I believe that? Huh? Do I believe that? I don't know. Okay, so my racist. answer to you is no, I'm not a racist. How many more times do I have to say that? <laughs> do you believe it? <laughs> All right, so stop asking that question. And let's get on with the other stuff. Well, here again, we see two forces in, in, in debate and argument, and I don't want to repeat last week's show because a lot of our viewers are here every week, but certainly this conflict became very intense. And uh, when we left last week, we were just near the end of the documentary discussion. Tell us how it ends and what your predictions are uh, for what might happen. And it's hard to do, but first of all, give us the closing of the documentary. Well, there really isn't an end to the, the problems that are going on. The documentary ends with really asking a question of who we are. Are we an immigrant nation? Um, there, there's a browning of America. We need to, to start dealing with the problems that we have here. So unfortunately in Farmingville, the, the situation continues. There was a firebombing of a Mexican family's home by high school students and it seems that that things are still simmering there quite quite a lot. Carlos, uh, we talked after the documentary and I had the privilege of being with you both last night and uh, for a period of time in discussing it. Um, there are really two questions. One is, are you optimistic? Do you think that from all of this difficulty that groups involved um, have learned that um, paths have been taken is not resolving it. I understand that the lady that we just saw, she um, is no longer leading the movement and others have come in. Um, what does the future look like? Mixed. I'd like to say I'm optimistic, but I think it's mixed. I think that um, for every action there's a reaction. There's always um, something that comes out of some, something good that comes out of something that comes out of something bad. Um, I think in Farmingville um, we do, uh, there has been a sort of a, a dampening of some of the more extreme um, sides of things, um, but uh, there does continue to be tension in there. So um, uh, there, uh, the, the, the men are there, the men continue to be there, some of them are now beginning to establish lives there. Uh, the question now be will become how are they going to be accepted over time if they do indeed continue to, 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 to be coming there. So um, I'm not, um, I'm neither optimi optimistic nor pessimistic, pessimistic. I'm, I'm rather pragmatic about it right now in the hopes that, that maybe there'll be some easing tensions o over time. Catherine, at the end of the last show we were talking about too that it's hard to put it exactly in these terms, but the fact that the compromise proposal was vetoed and a site was not uh, selected for the, the local government to use for the gathering for the workers each morning. Those who oppose immigration and, and along all those lines consider this a victory. Do you think that it has uh, uh, an unfortunate impact across America, or would the impact be different if the, it had been resolved differently in Farmingville? I think it would have been much different if it had been resolved 
in with a hiring site <clears throat> in Farmingville, uh, it would have really eased a lot of the tensions that the, the residents were complaining about. I mean, a, a lot of it is out of sight, out of mind. If you take the men out of the view from the street corners in front of the 7-Elevens and you put, put them in a place where they're safe, where people can come to hire them in a safe way, then it, it does help in many communities. This is happening. There are many sites across the country. There are several on Long Island as well and they have served to ease the tensions in the communities. I think that if Farmingville had adopted this resolution, that things would be different there today. And Carlos, one thing that I also thought about the document that was, again, powerful, some of those in the town who were most opposed to the immigrants being there, they were demanding from local political leaders or public leaders to do things that were, one, not in the jurisdiction of local governments or not even constitutional. It seems like to me there was a lot of irrationality that evolved, and, and wasn't there great frustration from those leaders to not to be able to convince us that you're asking us to do things that are not possible? Well, it was extreme frustration on the part of the leaders, extreme frustration, because I think they really wanted to be responsive to the community. Um, they wanted a healthy community. They wanted to do what they could within the limits of their jurisdiction and their power, uh, 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 jurisdictional power. And that was why traffic and safety is one thing that the county is in charge with and that they, they were trying to address that through the hiring hall. Um, so I think they were extremely, extremely frustrated. I mean, part of what we have to understand here is that what we have is, is a dysfunctional federal immigration system or policy. Uh, we, um, and it's historical. And I grew up in, the Calif in Southern California in the Southwest where, where um, there was no border to begin with and, and once, once it was there it was sort of uh, uh, not really terribly enforced because of convenience. When we needed the labor, people would come in. When we didn't, as in, during the, the D Great Depression, we wholesale deported them on trains, including American citizens of Mexican descent. Um, I think that that's part of what um, some of the people in Farmingville want to do, the more, ex more extreme sets, to talk, talk about bringing in tanks, army tanks, to rid the town, bringing in helicopters to deport the men. Not viable, not doable, not constitutional, not humane, you know, not, not right on any level. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, so, so that that extreme, that extreme is certainly not something that, that, that could happen. Thank you, Erla. Uh, I'm 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 replaying in my own mind what North Idaho went through probably uh, five, six, ten years ago, where the Aryan nations had a very strong presence, and it seems like there were four things that really came into play with uh, removing that group and, and getting the community to unite. And I, I wrote down that the local media played a key role, the religious community played a key role, our business leaders played a key role, and, and Tony was very active in an anti-hate group. Um, and all of those forces really came together to make a difference in our region. And I, I just wanted to ask both of you, starting with Catherine, what was the role of the local media? Did they take a leadership role? Did they, were they active in this dialogue at all? The local media was active in the dialogue. They, if you, t depending on who you talk to, <laughs> they, they took a much more pro-immigrant stance. So the people of Farmingville felt that they were unfairly branded as racists. And that came out in the newspapers. So Farmingville did begin to have this reputation of being a racist community, which was unfair. It, there are racists in the community, but it's, it's not a racist community. So the media did play that part to help fan those flames somewhat. Uh, also, I mean, just by publicizing the events that happen there, you begin to focus in on Farmingville and what's happening there. And they, the, the residents were, they every they would wake up and look at the news day and say, you know, I hope we're not on the front page of it today. So that that did play a, a large part in in the perception of Farmingville uh, over the rest of the island and in New York. And Carlos, I want to uh, follow up with the business community because to me, in my mind, um, they played a key role. In in that whole issue because of the contractors who needed that labor force. So did they come and stand up? Uh, the business community did come and stand up uh, at, at certain points along the way. Immediately after the beatings, 
Um, you have uh, someone like Matt Crossan, who is the um, head of the Long Island Business Association, the sort of island-wide chamber of commerce. And he took a very strong stand in saying that we do not want this to turn to another Skokie, Illinois. Um, he, called, he called this uh, the equivalent of, of a lynching uh, in terms of the beatings. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and so there, there, there was that, there was at least after the beatings that sort of, that sort of, that sort of role. But, you know, the, the issue I think one, is one of, of sustained, um, of sustainability, of continued efforts. And, um, you know, after that, that, that initial burst of, of support, the problem becomes more intractable. And unless you go in day in, day out, um, that sort of support is, isn't necessarily going to be there along the way. And just to come back a little bit to the media, Catherine's right in terms of, 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 of Newsday um, uh, and the way the residents saw, saw what Newsday did there um, as sort of tarring them or branding them as racist. On the other hand, what Newsday did was bring attention to a, to a problem and, and really uh, highlight it, focus on it, brought attention to it in, in a way that, that allowed for a lot of other positive things to happen as well. So it, it's a double-edged sword. Um, uh, they, they went out on the limb. Um, in, in many ways, in, 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 in their strong position. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to suggest that they they were bad in what they did, but but they did bring they they brought the situation to light, which mm -hmm. was which was good. It needed to be brought to light. Good. It's really interesting that uh, in our work here, some have said the privilege of speaking of the United States, and we've always said in our work in human rights that all communities are unique in some ways, and. You don't have to reinvent the wheel on some points, but you also have to have your own unique approaches also. Here the media had a, maybe an easier task. The media certainly directed in very clear terms, both live and printed media, that there was no way that these communities here would uh, accept the doctrine of the Aryan Nation. So it was focused right there and then turned around and said, in a very positive way, the communities are united against this hate group and therefore praise the citizenry. So you didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Can you see what I'm saying? It was quite yeah. different. And so the media actually could help rally people and make them feel good about mm -hmm. opposing that particular <coughs> force of hate in the community. But I want to ask Catherine one question since she grew up in a border state, and then I'm going to turn to some ways how you dealt with your documentary. But coming from Oklahoma, and I came from a southern state, if this test had taken place instead of Farmingville, a town in the south about the same size, would it have been handled different by in-groups or out-groups or the media? Is, you know, there's been a, a look at uh, problems of racism and segregation in the South different from the North. Here's a, a very, very northern city or town. Would it have been handled different? I would hope that it would have, but I can't say that it would have. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience in Oklahoma City, it was not handled very well at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the shift in the population, the shift in the, the, the African American population coming into the the white communities, it was not handled well. So no, I, I don't know. I think that the, the main thing is that we need strong leadership. And that's what was really lacking in Farmingville. I suspected that from the documentary too. It takes extremely strong leadership. And I see in this documentary there was a division in leadership, first of all, between the passing of the, uh, the policy and the vetoing of it. Again, in our case, that was not the situation here. But again, it's a different situation. Uh, I've talked to you some about this before, but here you go in there, and I know you both have views and have philosophies about how you feel about things, but you removed that in the actual taping of the documentary. First question is, was that difficult to do? You, you, I know you had to do it, and you had to, to have success, you had to tell the whole story, but was there a lot of discipline involved in, oh, in dealing with this? Boy, was uh, there ever. <laughs> you know, there was and there wasn't. Um, there, it was it was easy while doing it, oddly enough, because um, it was a keep your eyes on the prize kind of situation and approach that, that we took, and I personally took uh, to it. Uh, again, our goal is for this documentary to bring people to the table, to get people to talk, not to demonize. So, um, so that, and you know, and identifying quite quite closely with and listening to each of the individuals in there. That was an honest effort. And they, 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 there were some great individuals that we came across in the town. And, and, and treating them with that sort of respect was not hard because they're, 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 many of them are, are great human beings. On the other hand, um, I uh, didn't realize the, the personal cost to me until just recently. Mm -hmm. um, I um, uh, was at a screening um, 
in, in Denver uh, with uh, at-risk high school students who were mostly Latino. They were all Latino in, in, this, in this little screening. And uh, they had no qualms about how they felt. And sure. um, somehow, seeing it through their eyes, I found myself suddenly able to let go of, of, of layers of, of, of sort of constraints that I didn't realize I'd had. Um, and I found myself bawling up throughout the entire screening. I was in a fetal position, tight, tighter than I'd ever been. And when I got up to speak with them, I, I couldn't. I literally couldn't. And I can only attribute, attribute that to the sort of residue of emotion that had to somehow, at some level, level or another, have been suppressed during the, the, the making of the film. But ultimately, as I said, we had a, a definite goal in mind, a definite reason for doing it, and, 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 and it was important to, to, to understand the concerns of, of each and every one of the players in this town. You know, Catherine, uh, did you have a similar experience? I, I did, but I have to say that when the national groups came in, and we had to listen to the people from Prop 187 spouting their doctrine. It was very difficult to keep a straight face and to, to allow them to speak. Uh, it was, it, my reactions were so strong, and I really, you know, as a documentarian, you really can't engage with your subject or you're muddying the waters. You just can't do that. So it was very difficult to, to listen to what they had to say and, and to stand passively and allow them to speak. But I think ultimately, because we did, we have a much better documentary okay. for it. And, and if you're going to get uh, in the documentary all the different sides and groups, you're, that's not going to happen unless you do it the way you did it. Exactly. Okay. Uh, it was. Uh, Interesting. Now then, the other question that we've also talked about before on the air, and that is, uh, and I suspect, and you've already confirmed it, that different groups are trying to recruit you to do a documentary <laughs> to, to their favor. Would you like to share? Catherine, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, well, I went to Washington, D.C. because the Sage and Quality of Life went down there to protest uh, President Fox's coming to speak with President Bush, Mexico's President Fox. and. As I sat on the bench at the end of the evening, uh, they didn't want me to be there, but as I sat there and talked with them, they were, they were all talking about, you know, it would be great if you really did this on for our point of view. And I mean, they were, this was the most overt time. There were other times, you know, throughout the filming that they, that people wanted us to, to do it from their point of view. I hope you write the script. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, what kind of experience did you have with the groups? Well, um, some very interesting ones. Um, uh, I think that the, the most interesting one was um, uh, for this uh, national conference, Day of Truth, um, uh, there was one individual who um, uh, was a Chinese origin and um, subsequently uh, asked me to join with her in forming uh, an immigration reform group um, um, where I think politically we saw things in very, very different lights. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, again, great intellectual, and I respected her in many ways, but that was rather, rather an interesting uh, outcome in, in there. I, I think it's a testament to Carlos's neutrality that she perceived that he might be someone who would go to her side. So uh, I think that's a real testament to his being <laughs> 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 completely uh, non-biased in his approach. One, one of the moments in the film that really struck me, too, was fairly near the end of the, f the documentary when the anti-immigration forces were having a, a gathering and they were I believe, on a lawn and they had some talk with some people who were going to speak at a rally and those at that gathering were very multiracial you know in fact the vice presidential candidate with Pat Buchanan was there and, and it certainly wasn't all white men and so forth how did that 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 discouraged me it was a from my perspective it, here they've brought together people from different races. Uh, I've never understood why someone who is a minority community would join forces with groups that are against another minority group or, or even their own minority group. Uh, well, it's, that's, that's a very difficult, vi difficult uh, issue to, 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 to address. Um, uh, I think that um, part of it, part of it in that particular gathering, which by the way was uh, in the backyard of the house that we re lived in in Farmingville, that I rented in Farmingville, oh. in interestingly enough. Um, uh, but um, and part of it was was that they were they did it on a calculated basis. They wanted to show that this was not about race, and so therefore they brought in um, 
uh, a couple of African Americans, uh, a Mexican American, or as she put it, an American of Hispanic descent. Please, um, please. Uh, At least you said Latino. Please. Uh, yes. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think that 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 a lot of that has to do um, with uh, the concerns of of of. Of of, of of job displacement, of wage depression mm -hmm. that, that comes up when, you, when you're talking about uh, undocumented workers, um, uh, and those are in some cases legitimate concerns. Um, a lot of it, and some of that has to do, I think, with um, the fact that no, none of us, none of us is, is, escapes racism or, 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 or the sense of the other at any level. No matter, um, I mean, within my own family, um, there are uh, people who will talk about wetbacks or will talk about, you know, the illegals, um, and and you know that's that is a, the unfortunate reality of it. Uh, none of us is, is exempt. What I'm hoping, though, what I'm the, what I find uh, is going to be the great one of the greater challenges that we're going to be facing in the next few years, is that a, as Latinos, as we are declared, have been declared by the census to be the largest minority now, um, what will that do to our relations with the African American community? Mm -hmm. I think that there are forces at work to try to divide us rather than to have us work together. Um, and I think that if we give in to those forces um, and see it as, as a small contained pie that we have to battle over, we'll, we'll both lose. I think that, that the real challenge is to, to identify with each other and to work together um, uh, to try to, to realize that, 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 um, you know, we, uh, that, that, that we, can't, we, we cannot and we should not be divided um, and that we do have a lot, of, a lot in common in, with regards to, to our, our position as, as people of color in this country. So divide and conquer has been a theory that some have used uh, in, in the power struggles. Uh, we've just got a few seconds left, but does this documentary uh, create uh, desires to do other documentaries of similar type, Catherine? Well, I, I don't think I want to go back into this issue particularly. Okay. I, I'm moving on. I, I'm working on the Patriot Act next. Okay, so <laughs> on that note, we'll bring the permanent conclusion. That's another great challenge for you. <laughs> That'll be a major documentary. Ladies and gentlemen, we've very much enjoyed the past two weeks uh, of interviewing our wonderful guests, the co-producers of that very strong, effective documentary called Farmingville. As I indicated at the beginning of the program, it has received four major awards and, and received a very, very f supportive uh, editorial in the New York Times. And again, we want to thank Greg Greasy Carr Foundation from Cambridge for making this possible to have our wonderful guests here, not only in this program, but on our campus. Uh, next week, we shall turn to yet another issue, uh, and I hope you'll be with us at that time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.